Good to hear. Well, welcome to the second installment of six classes based on a video curriculum from Creation Ministry International called Putting the Pieces Together. Um, I'd, I thought I'd start out with a little review from last week uh, for those who weren't here or for those that were to try to remember what we covered. So I started with my story. Uh, I'm a PH, I have a PhD in physics from Washington State University in 1984. I became an atheist in college, like lots of young people do today when they go off to college. I came back to a belief in God and a Christian worldview when I saw how much of science was just driven by assumptions and how much that wasn't really known and then passed off as truth. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, I want to make sure this is not about me, this is about God and how we can prevent the beliefs of our culture from undermining our faith and the faith of our children. So, um, Creation Science, Creation Ministries International, or CMI, are, is the organization that provided the video we're about to see. Uh, and they've got a great website, creation.com, with lots of good resources, books, DVDs, etc. They have Creation Magazine, Journal of Creation, and they also have Creation Conferences, trips, cruises. They're going to uh, Egypt this fall, I think. So check out the website and see what's going on. And then Answers in Genesis is another creation science ministry, and they have Answers Magazine, The Ark Encounter, and the Creation Museum in Kentucky, in our backyard almost. So I'd urge you to go see that. So last week, <clears throat> we talked about the Christian worldview, and the key verse was, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will, from Romans 12, 2. So they, you remember they said ideas have consequences, and they're not just in your head, and they showed the picture of the 9-11 attacks. Um, so what is a worldview? We covered that. It's a belief system about reality. Everybody has one. And it's not formally taught to us in a classroom or in a school, but it's caught as you grow up. And it colors our perception of all of life's experiences. Uh, as Christians, we need to start with the Bible in our thinking in every area. It's like putting our, our biblical glasses on to, to understand the world. <clears throat> we talked about the difference between operational or observational science and historical science. Operational science has brought us such wonders as cell phones, airplanes, surgeries. Uh, we can do experiments in a lab, make measurements, subject things to different environments and see how they respond. Historical science is a study of what happened in the past. Where did all this stuff come from, basically? Remember they said nothing exploded and here we are. That's what science believes. Assumptions are the key in historical science because nobody was really there to witness what happened. And all of the observations we make are in the present. Uh, none are in the past because we cannot go back in time. Uh, even past events that were witnessed and recorded by people are often clouded by opinion and propaganda. And I do like this quote at the bottom of the chart here by Will Durant, who uh, was the author of the 11-volume uh, story of civilization and received a Pulitzer Prize and the Presidential Medal of Freedom. He said, our knowledge of the past is always incomplete, probably inaccurate, but clouded by ambivalent evidence and biased historians, and perhaps distorted by our own patriotic or religious partisanship. Most history is guessing and the rest prejudice. So what, what is man's, secular man's view of, uh, of the history of the, the universe? A man's reasoning gives us the billions of years of the evolutionary worldview. The cosmos evolved, the earth evolved, and life evolved, according to that worldview. And in that worldview, man decides the truth for himself. It's inherently atheistic, it's without God, it assumes that all that exists is matter and energy and space and time, and there's no spiritual realm, and again, nothing exploded and here we are. And they talked about the fruit of that evolutionary worldview, uh, where it implies that we were not created for a purpose, we're just a cosmic accident, and it kind of destroys meaning, significance, and purpose in life, destroys Christian values, 
And, and these views work out in people's behavior, as we've seen recently with school shootings and other horrible events. So that was last week. Um, this week's lesson is Six Days and the True History of the Universe. Oh. <clears throat> we will explore the biblical history of the universe and sample some of the evidence that supports it. I'll follow up with some discussion about dating methods and the Big Bang model, and then I'll answer questions. So get your questions ready. Uh, the remaining lessons will be next week we're going to talk about fossils, the flood, and earth science. August 3rd, we're going to talk about living things. August 10th, there's no class. August 17th, talk about dinosaurs and how we can apply our biblical worldview to dinosaurs. That should be fun. And then August 24th, we'll cover frequently asked questions. So with that, I think we'll go ahead and start the video. It doesn't matter whether you're teaching in preschool or whether you're teaching in high school. It doesn't matter whether you're teaching in science or whatever particular area you're teaching in. This issue is an issue which affects all of us. And uh, the reason it affects all of us, it doesn't matter whether our children are three or four years old, they're coming into our, our school, they're coming in with a certain worldview which they've picked up from the television and they've got certain ideas. There's a whole worldview in our culture and it's important for us as Christians and as teachers to understand that we're in a battle of worldviews. That's what it's about. So that we might be, you might be saying, why are we focusing on this area and just this area? Really, it's understanding that there's a, a cultural battle, a battle of worldviews. If we were living in a country like, say, Indonesia, and we were running a Christian school in Indonesia, we would want to understand the Muslim worldview. So we would be able to equip our students to be able to handle that within the culture that they live in. And so we need to understand the secular worldview so that we can equip our students to be able to live and make an impact in our culture. And the problem in the church has been, uh, for when I was growing up, is that this issue was not really addressed. Young people were not prepared. And so you have a situation where young people have not been able to make contributions when they've been at university and uh, that sort of an area because they haven't understood the issues. That's what we hope to do today. Whether your children are coming in in, in preschool, they'll come in with a worldview. I heard of a lady just recently who was um, reading a book to her child. She said she was reading a book about Adam and Eve. And uh, as she was reading this book, her, bo uh, her boy said, hey, where, does, uh, where do the dinosaurs fit into this? Right? She had no idea where they fitted in. She went to see a pastor. He gave her material which was able to help her. She said it answered questions that she had had for years and never was going to ask. And so that's why this is relevant. It doesn't matter whether, where, where you're teaching this issue of, of this worldview. And six days uh, and the history of the universe is foundational to understanding the difference between these two worldviews. And so once, you, once we understand this... We can understand how we can apply it in our actual situation. If I was to ask you whether you believe that God created, I'm sure that you would all say that God created. I don't think I've ever met a Christian who hasn't said or, or that God created this world. But there's been a lot of people that I've met who've said that they don't believe it's important whether God created in six days. There are many... Uh, very prominent and very good Christian teachers. People teach in theological college who wouldn't make a stand on the fact that God created in six days. And uh, when we think about why that is, and uh, there's a, I have a quote here from a fellow by the name of Charles Hodge. He's been a very prominent theologian and has uh, books on systematic the uh, theology. And he goes on to talk about the cre uh, creation, an evangelical he says uh, about Genesis, it is of course admitted that taking this account by itself, it would be the most natural to understand the word in its ordinary sense. In other words, if you just read what the Bible says, it's pretty clear that it's talking about ordinary days. 
That's what the quote that Don had from James uh, from Barr was about, the Hebrew professor, that if you just take what the Bible says, it seems pretty clear that it's just to be most natural to take it in its ordinary sense. But if that sense brings the Mosaic account into conflict with the facts and another sense avoids such conflict, then it is obligatory on us to adopt that other. In other words, it seems to be talking about ordinary days, but that conflicts with the facts. So we need to find another explanation. And uh, one a little cartoon, I think, that uh, sums up what's been happening is here we've got these layers of rocks, like you see when you drive along the road and you might have a road cut. You can see these layers of rocks. And uh, this geologist is looking at these layers of rocks and he's saying, the Bible's not true. These rock layers show that the earth is millions of years old. You've got to believe me, I'm a scientist. And the theologian says, well, I'll just accept those millions of years and I'll add it into the Bible. And that's what Hodge, the very prominent, very famous, widely used evangelical theologian, I'll just accept those millions of years and, and I'll add it into the Bible. But you see, it's not as simple as that because the Bible is about history. It's not a science book. It's a history book. And as uh, this uh, very famous teacher, Martin Lloyd-Jones, said, our Christian faith is based entirely upon history. It's quite unique because it's te it is teaching which is based on history. Our Christian faith is entirely different to Buddhism, Hinduism, and other uh, faiths, for example. It calls attention to facts. The Garden of Eden, do you remember the history of the flood? That's a fact. That is history. Then God gave a new start, the Tower of Babel, Abraham, the facts about our Lord. So you see, history is the important thing about our Christian faith. It's not just an imagination. It's not just a feeling. It's rooted in history. And that's where our salvation comes from. The gospel is based on history, the fact that mankind sinned. And that's why we need a saviour. Jesus came. It, it uh, is a, a real thing which happened uh, at a certain year in the reign of Tiberius Caesar, it's history. His death and resurrection, it was people who historical figures, Pilate, Herod, and it was a place in Jerusalem. It was a certain place there at a certain time of the year. It's all based on history. And because of that reality, we can be saved and we can have eternal life. So you see, the, it's, uh, that's the importance of history. A lot of people say, well, the Bible isn't a, a science book. The Bible is really, you know, the Bible's a book about morality and salvation and, and, and science is about, uh, you know, we go to science to find out the answers to the questions like how things happened and when things happened. We go to the Bible to find out the answers to the questions like why they happened. So there's this two, two uh, 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 what you might say, two compartment view. But you see, it's not quite like that, you see. Both creation and evolution, these two worldviews, they're two views of history. Because the Bible is an account of creation, it's a claim about history. It tells us what happened, it tells us when it happened, and it tells us by what agent God created in six days. The evolution story, it's a creation story, it's a claim about history as well. What happened, when it happened, and by what agent. So we really have two competing claims here about how this world came into being. Two worldviews, Christian worldview, Don's put up the slide about this way of looking at the world. It was all done in six days, about 6,000 years ago. And then we have this other worldview, which is based upon natural processes, survival of the fittest over millions of years. And according to this view, of course, the earth, which came about billions of years after the Big Bang, the earth is some 4,500 million years old since it first came into being. And when you look at these two worldviews, one of the big things that strikes you is uh, one of the contrasts between them. Can you see what, what, what the big contrast is? The big contrast is time. Can you see that? One says 6,000 years. One says 4,500 million years. And of course, if it's going to happen by itself, by natural processes, you do need a lot of time. And this, the, the conflict of these two worldviews, this battle that's occurring in our culture is very much a battle over the time of things. I had an email from a fellow by the name of Phil a couple of years ago. 
trained as a doctor in one of the universities in Australia. And uh, he had went in as a, into the, the medical field. And this is what he said. He said in, he was a Christian. He was, uh, grew up in a Christian home. And he said in the first year of his course, one of my lecturers would put up overheads of the timeline of the Genesis creation account. And he would laugh and scoff at it. And then he would put up the evolution timeline in contrast and say how obvious it was that this was a more logical and reasonable proposal. In almost every lecture following, he would attack Christianity in some form. And he wrote us in this email to say just what a battle it was for him and other Christian students in this university to hold on to their Christian faith with this sort of uh, a battle attack on it. And, and, and that's where it's relevant to Christian teachers in that the students that you're teaching will be going into these institutions and they will be encountering what you've been taught will be attacked in these institutions and so they need to be prepared and equipped to be able to withstand. We don't want to have people, you know, it's sort of Christian soldiers going into battle that are not armed and not equipped, do we? We want to make sure that they are equipped. They do see the strategies. They do understand the issues and are able to deal with it because if they are not equipped, what's the response? They're going to put their head in the sand, just keep, their, keep quiet and really be able to have no impact? Or as what Don did, as he, he said... He divided his, his mind into two parts. There was a faith part, where he's a religion, the Bible, a gospel, church, and morals on the Sunday. And then he operated in a different part of his mind during the week with science, facts, history, and geography and reality. So it's important. One of the most important things on this issue is to understand where science fits into this. Understand how science works. And uh, when we talk about science, a lot of people think that science is about facts. That when we, the, the scientists speak about something, uh, as uh, Charles Hodge, the systematic theologian says, the Bible says this, but if the facts say that, we really can't go with what the Bible says. So the, science is about facts, and so the Bible has to fit in with these facts. But when we're talking about the origin of the earth, and um, when we're talking about how things came into be. Fossils figure very prominently in that. A lot of people think that fossils exist in the past. You know, when you're digging up a fossil, you're digging up the past. But in reality, the fossils exist in the present. Science is, is talking about observation. We do have the laboratories where we have experiments where we observe things in the present. And uh, we can't go back into the past to observe this dinosaur. We can see that he's dead. He exists in the present. All the scientific observations are made in the present. And so we, science is limited in its, uh, what it can do about the past. It's like this. We, we, we've had a lot of good things happen to us as a result of science. We've got this computer. We've got motor cars. We've got modern medicine and all those sorts of things. And because of the good things that science has delivered, what happens is that people think, well, of course, it's delivered the goods. It must be right. But you see, experimental science, which is uh, what I call the things that, uh, where we can observe things and carry out experiments and put up hypotheses and test those hypotheses, those are things which are done in the present. For example, we can, we can see the effect of gravity. We could get a ball. We could throw it in the air and watch what happens to the ball when it uh, goes through the effect of gravity. That's an experiment that we could do. We could do it uh, again to see what the effect is. Get out a camera and photograph it, right? And so do all sorts of experiments where we observe and measure. That's experimental science. But when we're talking about the past, we don't have the past. We can't go back in time. We can't go there and video what happened in the past. We can't see those first fish, supposedly 300 million years ago, growing these legs and coming out onto the land. And so that is a totally different thing. It's a little bit like forensic science. It's not based on observation. It's based on deduction, on speculation, on circumstantial evidence. So we've got observation. Two people looking at the world. Creationists, evolutionists don't have different evidence. We have got the same evidence. We have got the same world. These two people are looking at the same evidence. But we start with different assumptions. The evidence is in the present. A person who starts with the Word of God, that the Word of God is true, that's their way of looking at the world. And that's what we want to help our students to do, 
is to be able to look at the world so that they look at it with a, a biblical Christian worldview. And as a result of those, that, that way of thinking, they're able to interpret the evidence with their uh, biology, their astronomy, their geography, their mathematics, their, and all those different areas of thinking, they're able to do it based on God's word. But then there's the idea that man decides truth. That way of thinking leads to different interpretations of the evidence. So it's not a, uh, an issue of science versus religion. Basically, it's two worldviews. It's two religions, two assumptions, two faith positions. There's the uh, faith position that God created compared with the other idea that the world made itself. These two assumptions are the starting assumptions. They don't change. And, uh, but the, uh, the interpretations do change. And that's a really, really powerful diagram to understand the whole nature of the way science works. And uh, they understand that it's the foundational faith positions are so important in being able to determine the interpretations and, of the evidence. And once our students can understand that, they will be able to look at the evidence in radical, out-the-box sort of ways of looking at it. When they go to the universities and they understand these concepts, they'll be able to see things that other students won't be able to see. And they will be in a position to become the leaders in the future because they've got a very powerful way of looking at the world. And uh, so we talked about these two different ways of thinking. And, and that's even recognized by science, like Richard Lewontin, saying that basically most scientists today start with the idea that the world made itself. And Richard Lewontin, professor of genetics, and he's uh, writing in this, uh, in this book, Billions and Billions of Demons, he says, uh, regarding scientists, he says, we take the, the side of science, that is evolutionary science, naturalistic science, the idea that there was no supernatural involved. We take the, si the side of science in spite of the patent absurdity of some of its constructs, in spite of its failure to fulfill many of its extravagant promises of health and life, in spite of the tolerance of the scientific community for unsubstantiated just-so stories, because, because we have a prior commitment, a commitment to materialism. Moreover, that materialism is absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. So that's where it's liberating for us and for our students to see that there's, there's two worldviews that are operating based on two faith positions. And so we, can, we need not be ashamed of starting with the Bible. Our students don't have to go to university and to be, to be sort of timid and afraid of saying, well, I'm working on faith and everyone else is working on science. They are able to st take the stand shoulder to shoulder and look straight in the eyes and say, yeah, of course, that's where I'm starting from. But have you thought about where you're starting from? So we start from the Bible and from the Bible, from the chronologies, as James Barr says, we can understand Adam lived so many years and he begets Seth. And then Seth lived so many years, and we've got a chronology there which ties in the biblical worldview reasonably simply into the time before the flood and right up to the time of Abraham, which, uh, and then into more sort of recent times of David and Solomon and those sorts of people. We can understand how the Bible worldview fits together. See, Jesus believed the Bible as it was uh, just written there. He was asked about marriage in Mark chapter 10, verse 6. And Jesus said, from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. To understand the meaning of marriage, you have to go back to the origin of marriage. To understand the meaning of anything, you have to go back to its origin. So he goes back to the origin. God made them male and female. Now that makes sense within what the Bible says, as Jesus understood and as Jesus believed. And uh, we've got a timeline here where Jesus is speaking at the end of the timeline. He goes back to the beginning of the timeline uh, some 4,000 years before he was speaking, and Adam and Eve, the first man and the first woman, the first male and female were created when? On day six. But you see, if indeed the universe evolved over billions of years, if there was that big bang that we were spoken about some 15,000 millions of years ago when nothing exploded and it became everything, and then over billions of years things have evolved until eventually the earth formed and then life evolved, and according to this idea, that's a timeline which represents that time. 
The man, Adam and Eve, the first man and the first woman, came about some one million years ago. And so even with what Jesus said there, it only makes sense within just taking the Bible just straightforward as it reads within 4,000 years. Otherwise, you've got the, the male and female appearing at the end of time. So you see, the Bible is consistent. It's a package deal. The biblical worldview hangs together within a creation in six days as some 6,000 years ago. There's other evidence from the New Testament. Jesus said, this generation will be held responsible for the blood of all the prophets that have been shed since the beginning of the world. From the blood of who? Abel to the blood of Zechariah. Blood of Abel since the beginning of the world. And it's uh, uh, interesting to see that basically within the Christian church, it's only been in the last 200 years that people have tried to make the world older than what the Bible says, older than about several, several th uh, thousands of years. Various authorities uh, are working out the age of the earth from uh, Hales, a, a, a new analysis of the chronology and uh, geography, history and prophecy, Young's Analytical Concordance, quite showing the ages that people have assigned to the earth, starting from uh, the most well, the well known one, of course, is Usher, 4004. Various uh, people have calculated different ones, but they're all within several thousand years. Usher's 4004, and it's only been since the ideas of geology coming in with Hutton, which we which we uh, will deal with later on. It's only since then that the idea that perhaps the world is billions of years old, that's, that's come in. So let's have a look at these dating methods. Remember Charles Hodge said, if the, if the uh, mosaic account conflicts with the facts, then we're, it's obligatory on us to change the our understanding of the mosaic account to fit in with the facts. So these dinosaurs that we dig up, when we dig up these paleontologists, dig up these dinosaur bones, we love this little diagram which illustrates that you don't have a label attached to the bone. The secret is you just dig up the bone. There's no label which says, I'm 65 million years old. See, the, the, the bone is the scientific evidence. And uh, that's, that's uh, what we have to work with. Even when we talk about radioactive dating, a lot of people think how amazing radioactive dating is. And uh, I did some of that when I went back with um, as my, my, a mature age student at the university. This is one of the machines that I did some work on, high precision mass spectrometer, which measures the chemicals or the isotopes in rocks and uh, various samples are placed in that machine. But even though it's so impressive, it's worth millions of dollars. It can make measurements to an accuracy of eight decimal places. Even in, with all that, the fact remains. We can't escape from the fact that all the measurements are made in the present. See, when we're talking about the age of something, it's actually not possible. In spite of what we hear, it's not possible to be able to scientifically measure the age of something. This machine does not measure age. It's impossible to measure age. It simply measures the isotopes in a sample in the present. That's all it measures. And a lot of people uh, say, talk about radioactive dating. They say it's like an hourglass. You have the uranium, which is decaying into lead. And if you, you sort of you can work out what's in the top and work out what's in the bottom, we know how fast it's going through there. And so it's simple matter like an hourglass to be able to work out the time. Well, the fact is, we don't know how much was in the rock at the beginning. So how do we go back in time to be able to find that out? We don't know the, how much of the, the, this product was in the rock at the beginning. We don't know how much was gained since the rock's been in the ground, since it formed. We don't know if there was any lost. We don't know if any of this was gained. We don't know if any of this was lost. We don't really know if the rate's been constant. We've all had those experiences with our glasses, haven't we? We've tipped them over and we found that they've uh, not been running along as smoothly. So you see, we can make measurements in the present, but we can't measure the age. To, to calculate an age, we have to make lots of assumptions. All these things have to be assumed. And we weren't there to see it happen, so we can't know for sure whether our assumptions were right. And even uh, when we make assumptions about rocks of a known age, Use uh, radioactive dating 
Potassium argon is used on historic lava flows. Mount St. Helens there, we can see 1986. Uh, it was um, 10 years old, this particular rock, when it formed. It was dated at uh, 3.35 million years to 2.8 million years, various samples. A Kilauea in Hawaii, an eruption less than 200 years old, gave ages up to 22 million years. Hulalalai in Hawaii, again, about 200 years old, gave ages from 160 million years to 3,300 million years. Because they're historical uh, observed eruptions of lava flows, people who do the analysis say, well, it's obvious that they're not the right dates because we observed it happening. But you see, if it doesn't work on dates where we know the age, how do we know that it's going to work on, on uh, rocks where we, where we don't know the age? And another secret about radioactive dating, which most people are not aware of, but you can pick it up if you're alert to it and uh, keep uh, up to date with some of the various reports in the newspapers, the secret is that no geologist will accept an age. No geologist will accept the number that comes back from the radioactive dating lab unless it fits in with what they think it should be. No, and uh, I'll just give you an example of that, which has been in the press in Australia in recent years. You might have heard of uh, Mungo Man, uh, the remains which are found in Lake Mungo. There was Mungo Woman was found in 1969, Mungo Man in 74. There's these um, sand dunes around this old lake bed, and in 74, the remains of Mungo Man was found. A Mungo Woman was dated, according to carbon-14 on bone appetite, as 19,000 years. This was the oldest age, measured age, of any remains in Australia that had ever been made, and it made headline news about the first settlers in Australia, 19,000 years old. Then carbon-14 was done on the bone collagen, got 24,000 years. That became the, old, the, the date. Carbon-14 on nearby charcoal gave a date of 26,000 years. That became the date because it was really putting Australia on the map within the uh, evolution uh, uh, scheme of things. Then people did some dates on Mungo Man. They measured the thermoluminescence of some sand grains, Bala et al., and got a date of 42,000 years, which was incredibly remarkable. Uh, world uh, sort of uh, headline news about the evolution of humans in Australia. Uh, so Bowler at L, I think it's, he's uh, from uh, Melbourne University, and uh, the, uh, the research was done here. And then Thorne at uh, ANU in Canberra did elect uh, electrospin resonance, optical stimulated luminescence, proactium uranium methods, thorium uranium methods, all these different methods are on Mungo Man and got an age of 62,000 years. And so there was agreement between the four methods and it was a very, very strong result, 62,000 years. And uh, it should have been very, very accepted. That's the new age for the human occupation in Australia. Problem is that in this case, it means that evolution occurred in Australia before it occurred in other parts of Europe. This date was out of sync with the dates of evolution in other parts of Europe. But Thorne said, that's fine. He said, I believe that evolution occurred in many parts of the world, sort of multi-regional bases. But Bowler from Melbourne University didn't hold to that view of evolution. So he didn't accept the 62,000 years as, as a valid date. So there's quite a debate going on about this, and Bowler, writing in the Journal of Human Evolution, says about Thorne's dates, for this complex laboratory-based dating to be successful, the data must be compatible with the external field evidence, which is what we say anyway. It, 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 we can only accept these results if it agrees with the external field evidence. The problem is that the field evidence was blowing away. The wind was blowing the sand away. And uh, there was a very interesting comment in one of the uh, discussions on this where somebody said, well, the answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. The answer is blowing in the wind. They can't go and repeat it. And Bowler said, look, he gave reasons. Well, the uranium method's wrong because of uranium migration. The electrospin resonance is wrong because of uranium migration. The optical stimulated luminescence is wrong because of poor sample collection. Carbon dating's wrong because of contamination. Basically, you can get any age you like depending on the assumptions you're making. And what's happening here is that Bowler is making different assumptions about the same results 
to give an answer which he prefers over to the ones that Thorn has. So, uh, carbon-14, a lot of people ask about carbon-14. And here's a piece of sandstone found uh, in the sandstone in Sydney. It's a nice picture of Sydney Harbour showing the sandstone, the Hawkesbury sandstone. It's dated uh, by fossil evidence as 230 million years. This piece of sandstone which came out of a quarry had a piece of enclosed wood. We sent that off to be dated, to be analysed for carbon-14. There should have been none in it because carbon-14 can't measure millions of years. It's got a half-life of five and a half thousand years or so. And so it should all be gone. There should be no carbon-14 left. But it's discovered that there was carbon-14 in that piece of wood, which indicated that it's clear, definite evidence that they, uh, the age of those rocks can't be those millions of years. Carbon-14 actually is a friend of the biblical worldview. There's lots of evidence for the idea that this world is young when you take it on face value. None of the evidence is definite in, because we have to make assumptions. But when we look at, say, galaxies, for example, the way they are rotating, the fact that we can see these arms in galaxies means that they can't be the billions of years old that they're supposed to be. Otherwise, they would have been all rotated up. So there's a conflict here in the ages of galaxies. The amount of salt in the ocean can estimate the amount of salt that's flowing in and the amount of salt that's in the ocean and how much is going out. And based on various assumptions, the normal sorts of assumptions, that things have always happened as they are in the past as they are today, gives an age of 62 million years, which is far too low for the age of the ocean. But as I said, you can get any age you like, depending on what assumptions you make. So an evolutionist, a person who believes the world is old, would say, well, it's obviously a wrong answer. So he'll make different assumptions to get an age which fits more in line with what he thinks it should be. But a person who believes the Bible, this is a good answer for us. We can say, well, we can think of lots of reasons why there would be more salt in the ocean than just can it be accounted for by today's rivers. Can you think of a reason why there would be a lot more water flowing into the ocean in the past? I can. It's called Noah's flood. Similarly with the seafloor sediments. The amount of sediments on the seafloor, they, they are sort of the thickness of those indicates that the seafloor is not billions of years old. It's less than 12 million based on current rates. And so another, another example of a, a process that gives an age which is far too young. And of course, at 12 million years, can easily be adjusted to the biblical time frame by taking account of Noah's flood. Comets. Comets disintegrate when they go around the sun. And so the solar system can't be billions of years old because we would, otherwise we would not have any short period comets going around the sun. They would have all disintegrated. Uh, they would all be gone in less than 20,000 years, yet they're still here. And of course that's far too young for a person who believes the universe is billions of years old. And as I said, you can get any age you like, depending on the assumptions you make. So a person who believes the universe is billions of years old assumes that there must be an invisible supply of comets way out beyond the edge of the, uh, of the solar system called the Oort cloud, which is sending these things in, replenishing them. Look at shoreline erosion. You've had one of your apostles fall down. But it's common, shoreline erosion. Here in the UK, the, uh, the lighthouse... Uh, has been threatened there on the Cretaceous chalk on the White Cliffs. They've eroded 21 metres in 170 years. Now, if those cliffs were really as old as is claimed, the Cretaceous, some 65 million years, then they, they should have eroded some 8,000 kilometres. Shoreline erosion is far too fast. We go to caves. We hear that caves are stalactites and stalagmites, you know, hundreds of thousands of years old. Carlsbad Caves. Jerry Trout made an observation about the um, uh, sign outside the Carlsbad Caves. He said from 20, 1924 to 1988, there was a visitor sign above the entrance to the Carlsbad Caverns that said Carlsbad was at least 260 million years old. In 1988, the sign was changed to read 7 to 10 million years old. Then for a little while, the sign read that it was 2 million years old. So now the sign's gone. So you see... The age of things is very much speculation. Here's a stalagmite shawl. This is based on observation. This is based on eyewitness account in an abandoned Wellington mine 
which is less than 150 years old. And if you didn't know, you would think it was hundreds of thousands of years old. When you look at opals, for example, people think that opals take millions of years to form. That's the thing. You go into a jeweler shop, millions of years in the making, this little opal. But this one was, uh, was uh, uh, made or formed by a guy called Len Cram, who's an opal miner in Lightning Ridge. He's figured out a way of making opals in Vegemite jars. He gets the sediment from around Lightning Ridge, certain kind of sediment, certain kinds of liquid, and he says within a couple of weeks the opal colour appears in the sediment just there. Under a microscope, it's exactly the same uh, structure as on a normal opal. might take a little bit longer than a few weeks to cure, but certainly the opal, opal appearance is there. These ideas, we get the idea that they're millions of years. Even the growth of the world population. If you look at the world population, it can't be hundreds of thousands of years that humans have been evolving since the Stone Age. It fits in with the age of the earth since Noah's flood when there were eight people, half a percent population growth, which is fairly typical. The origin of various civilizations, China and Egypt and Samaria, uh, they are all post-flood, the origin of agriculture, the origin of writing, the origin of languages. And so these things are something that in our teaching that we can pick up clues, even from books that are promoted from an evolutionary perspective, we can find clues which we're able to show to our students to show how the real evidence fits in with the Bible, with the seven C's of history. There's nothing in science, in the dating methods and that, which refutes the biblical time frame, 6,000 years since creation. And uh, one of the uh, key things, of course, the Tower of Babel, there was a, we uh, had that read to us this morning when the languages were confused. And after that event, people travelled to different parts of the world. And of course, when they travelled to different parts of the world, they took their, their, their memories with them, their knowledge of the history, the true history of the earth with them. So we find amongst the Australian Aboriginal folk, for example, Bundabra people up there near Broome, Jimmy Bird tells a story about uh, Aboriginal uh, understanding of where things came from. He says, long, long ago, there was a great flood. It happened because some children found the winking owl and plucked out all of its feathers. The bird flew without wings into the heavens and showed himself to Nagawangu, the great father. Nagawangu became very angry and decided to drown the people. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Later, the people saw a small cloud rising, which grew bigger and bigger till it spread over the whole sky. The thunder began to roll and crash, and the people were greatly afraid. With the rain and thunder was a terrible wind, which broke limbs off trees and uh, rooted up others. From the west, a man with his wives with a dog were battling their way in a canoe, when a bird with a leaf in its mouth flew in front of them, showing them the way to Mount Broom. They eventually reached Mount Broom, where they landed, where some other survivors were. All the other people were drowned. So you can see how when you're teaching about Aboriginal culture within a Christian setting, how you can make a link to the culture itself and show how it fits in with the biblical worldview. It applies to every culture because we're all descendants, like Aboriginals, descendants of Adam and Eve. And no, they came to Australia after the flood. They got strong cultural, linguistic and genetic links to the uh, Vida people of South India and Sri Lanka find similar things in China. This is a Chinese symbol for the word ship, pictogram. It's made up of the, a symbol for vessel, a symbol for eight, and a symbol for people. A little, little uh, pictograph for those three things. Where would the idea of eight people on a vessel come from in China? Where would they get the idea that a ship is eight people on a vessel? Well, of course, the, uh, the Bible talks about Noah's flood. How many people were on the ark? Noah and his wife, their three sons and their three wives, eight people. And, they, and there's just multitudes of these connections. Even in the temple, the uh, temple of heaven, it's a temple to the true God of heaven, the, 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 the God, the eternal God, Shangdi. And uh, so when you look, even look into the culture of, say, China, we see these links which go back to their true history in the Tower of Babel. They've got a knowledge of God, the knowledge of sin, a knowledge of the need for a sacrifice to be made right with God. And so we find these links. But it's, it's the idea of evolution, which, the, which is the idea that we evolve from ape-like ancestors, which, which gives the impression that some people are less evolved and others are more evolved. 
So you end up with things like this, Otter Banger, a young guy from Africa who was put in a zoo to show people, you know, this is a living example of the intermediate link between the apes and the ancestors. Here's just a guy from Africa. And he was a, a, a human being put in a zoo in New York. It's a, a story which is a very tragic story, but comes out of evolutionary thinking. Ideas have consequences. Ideas have consequences. And if we think that some people are less evolved and others are more evolved, we, it affects the way we look at other people. But you see, the biblical view is that it was one man and one woman. They had sons and daughters. And out of those sons and daughters, Noah and his sons and their family, we're descended from them. And then we're all different people groups, but there's just one blood. And so you see the importance of the true history of the universe. It's tied in together. It's a package deal. And it's quite different from the other worldview which is being taught in our culture. And that's why it's just important, so important for Christians to understand how it fits together so that they can give as students the ammunition and the insight to be able to really stand firm in this battleground in this world. that illustration of the bone with the label attached that says I'm 65 million years old. So we've dug up bones, we've brought rocks back from the moon, um, but none of them have that label attached that tells us their age. Uh, many of these dating methods, as, as he mentioned, have certain assumptions in common that I will try to illustrate with this water bottle. So how long do you think this water bottle has been sitting down there on that Alter, any guesses? Ah, <laughs> uh, you, you had the benefit of actually seeing it placed there. Uh, the, these scientists that dig up things in the present uh, have, didn't, weren't there when they were put there, basically. So now let, let's imagine that, that we're these scientists trying to estimate how, how long this water bottle has been sitting there. And we're given the information that an ounce of water evaporates from the bottle per day. Uh, given that information, how long do you think it's been there? Looks like it's maybe a third to a half full of water, and I think it's about a 16-ounce bottle. So, so if, if it's just been evaporated, then that would be about 10 days. But did we assume that the bottle was, uh, was full of water to begin with? Yeah. And did we assume the rate of evaporation did not change with temperature, humidity, or some other environmental factor? And we also needed to assume that nobody came by and added more water to the bottle or took some out. So these types of assumptions are common to most dating methods. I'll, I'll walk you through a little bit of atomic theory here. Actually, there we go. Yeah, that's the one I want. So observational science, or, or what he calls operational science, where we look at things in the present, um, we know from, uh, from observational science that matter all around us is made up of atoms, and these atoms are mostly empty space uh, with a heavy nucleus consisting of protons and neutrons, and the picture in most people's minds is that the lightweight electrons orbit around this nucleus like planets in a miniature solar system. So in the top right there, you see a hydrogen atom with the, the little blue proton, heavy proton in the middle, and the little lightweight elect red electron orbiting around it. Um, atoms with different numbers of protons make up different chemical elements. So some of you may recognize the periodic table of the elements there. Uh, in the upper right, we have hydrogen with the one proton, one electron, and then move over to the upper left, helium with two protons, and then I think you have boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and so on, with more and more protons. Um, most um, atoms of the same element have the same chemical properties, but they can have different masses or weights because they can have a different number of neutrons. Usually, they have about the same number of neutrons as protons, but sometimes they have more, sometimes they have less, 
And these are called isotopes. Um, and you can see down at the bottom right, there's three isotopes of hydrogen. On the left one, I guess not all the text got displayed, but that's okay. Uh, hydrogen has the one proton, one electron, and then in the middle one has one proton, one neutron, that's deuterium, or H2, or 2H rather. And then the third one is tritium with two neutrons, one proton. Uh, so they have different masses, and a mass spectrometer can be used to determine how much of each of those isotopes is present in a sample. Now some of these isotopes are unstable, and they decay into other chemical elements. Kind of pictured on the upper right. There we're just showing a nucleus, uh, which gives off a couple fragments. It may have been hit by a smaller particle. Um, so it's a parent isotope that decays into daughter isotopes. So that the mass of particles on the lower left decays and the daughters are the ones that come off of that. So we have uh, decay chains going from uranium to lead. You see that first decay chain there starting with uh, 238U for uranium. Then that decays to thorium. Uh, and then it goes, it goes to radium, radon, and a bunch of other things, and several isotopes of lead before it, it finally gets to a stable isotope of lead. And that takes about four and a half billion years. Uh, then he, he mentioned the krypton to argon uh, decay, and that takes about 1.2 billion years. It's used a lot to measure the age of lava, rocks, and that sort of thing, because it's thought the argon being a gas comes, comes out of them and, and none of the daughter products present. Uh, but that's not necessarily true, as they found out with the Mount St. Helen ash. It dated much older than using the potassium argon method. And then the, there's the famous carbon-14, which decays to nitrogen in about 5,700 years. Uh, we can measure the rate of decay in the laboratory, and it turns out half of the parent atoms decay to daughter atoms in a half-life ranging from fractions of a second to billions of years. And I've drawn the curve for carbon-14 decay on the lower right. So you start out with 100% carbon-14, none of the nitrogen-14. And after 5,700 years, you're down to half. And then another 5,700 years, you're down to a quarter, then an eighth, then a sixteenth. So it, it drops off very quickly. And by the time you get out around 100,000 years, there's, nothing, there's not enough carbon-14 left to measure. So that's why they said you can only use carbon-14 to date like in the tens of thousands of years range. <clears throat> okay. Oh, sorry, that didn't come through. <laughs> Have to work on my PowerPoint ship. But basically, there's a table there that compares the assumptions made with trying to date the water bottle with trying to date a radioactive isotope. So there's a starting condition. Uh, in terms of the water bottle, we assumed it was full of water. In terms of the radioactive isotope, we assumed that only the parent material is present and none of the daughter material is present. We assume that nothing has been corrupted by chemical or physical processes. So we assume no water was added or removed from the bottle. And they assume that there's no parent or daughter material added or removed over these millions or billions of years, where there's all kinds of uh, chemistry that can leach material from these rocks. Uh, there's all kinds of physical processes breaking them up, melting them, resolidifying. And they assume that that doesn't affect that ratio of parent to daughter. And then there's the rate of change. We assume the evaporation rate doesn't change on the bottle. And scientists assume the decay rate does not change. Answers in Genesis did a study that, that does indicate that the decay rate did change and was actually much quicker in the past. Um, and, and what I really find interesting is what they said about scientists not accepting the, the results of these dating methods, unless it agrees with their other beliefs. They, they think they know about the age of the layers of rock that that sample may have came from, and if the dating method is way out of whack with what they think the age of that rock should be, then they'll reject it. 
We also saw that samples of, of known age from Mount St. Helens and, and other examples provides dates that are millions of years old when it just occurred. And comparisons between the different dating methods provide some wildly different results. Also, diamonds dated to billions of years old contain carbon-14, and they should not if they're billions of years old. Because remember, all carbon-14 is gone after 100,000 years. So I'll turn from radio isotope dating to the Big Bang model uh, that describes what secular science, secular science's best model uh, of the formation of the universe. So in the early, early 20th century, Edwin Hubble discovered that our universe appears to be expanding, and the farther away a galaxy is, the faster it is moving away from us. So if we're in that top frame up there, uh, the galaxies are pretty much spread out, and we look out there and we measure the distance. And uh, measuring that distance is very complicated. It has to do with uh, the cosmic distance scale, which jumps from a parallax kind of measure, measurement you know, I can see out of my right eye and I can see out of my left eye, I see it moving against the background of stars. And trigonometry can be used to measure that distance. And then from there, they found what they called standard candles, which were variable stars that they could estimate the brightness depending on, on how quickly it varied. And then given the fact that you know the absolute brightness, you can estimate the distance because the brightness falls off as 1 over distance squared because we live in a three-dimensional universe. Uh, and then from there, they, they started using supernovas to actually estimate distances to some of these distant galaxies, because they can see those bright stellar explosions uh, at great distances. So I, I believe those distance measurements are fairly reasonable and accurate. Uh, and then they measured the speed at which they're uh, going away from us using what's called redshift. So they look at the spectra, they break the light from these distant galaxies down into uh, the colors of it, and they can see certain absorption or emission lines of chemical elements. Uh, and then they, they notice that they're, they can measure those lines, those colors in a laboratory, and then they look at the colors in the distant galaxy and they notice they shift to the red. And that's due to a phenomenon similar to the Doppler shift, which some of you may have experienced if you were standing on a street corner and a police car with a siren goes by, and you can hear the pitch change as it goes by. It's higher pitched as it's coming towards you and lower pitched as it's going away. So that, that's a change in the wavelength of sound. And a similar change occurs in light. So the fact that these lines are shifted towards the red means they're, they're going a, away from us. And so he came up with a, uh, the idea that all these galaxies are moving away from us as the universe expands. Um, so if you kind of run the movie backwards, going from the top down to the bottom in this figure, you can see the galaxies getting closer and closer together until eventually they're all in one little tiny volume. Um, in fact, they thought it was a single point, which I think is absurd. But Then running the movie forward from that point, which started about 14 billion years ago, this very small volume would be, be unimaginably hot and rapidly expanding, It'd be so hot that atoms could not exist, It'd be a sea of plasma which light can't penetrate, but eventually it cooled down enough to form atoms and the light from that young hot universe was able to travel and, and uh, reach us and was discovered by some technicians at Bell Labs in the 1960s and that really cemented the Big Bang Theory because they thought it was evidence from that Big Bang. So anyway, what's, what's wrong with the Big Bang? What's the problems? The, the first problem is what started it. Uh, secular science can't answer that at all. Uh, they have no, no idea. It's kind of like nothing exploded. So it shouldn't have happened. And it also should not have expanded. It, it was a, very lot of a lot of mass in a very small volume. It should have formed a gigantic black hole, which, and nothing should have escaped. Nothing can ex escape the gravity of a black hole. But scientists get around this by saying the Big Bang uh, originated all space and time as well as matter and energy, so the space gets larger as the universe expands. And that leads to certain measurement problems. Um, then there's the problem three, the horizon problem. Uh, if we look in one direction and the other direction at this 
background radiation, it looks like it's exactly the same temperature. Uh, and it's actually to many, many decimal places. And the only way that can occur is if there was some method to exchange heat between those two regions. Well, here we are at the halfway point between that part of the sky and that part of the sky, and they're just now reaching us. So they could not have exchanged radiant heat with each other. Uh, so scientists came up with a, an explanation called inflation, where the early universe was exchanging heat, and then all of a sudden it expanded much faster than the speed of light, the speed of that radiation. So, so that's kind of a rescue device for, for the Big Bang. And then there's the, the flatness problem. I won't go into that because of time, but uh, our universe is very Euclidean. Euclidean geometry works really well. Two parallel lines will stay the same distance apart, and they won't converge or, or go away. Um, and, and in order to do that, the conditions of the Big Bang had to be very precise to one part in 10 to the 120th power. And then there's dark matter. We need more gravity to, uh, from this dark matter to explain the way the galaxies are rotating uh, and the galaxy clusters are, are continuing to cluster. And then there's dark energy. We need less gravity because the expansion of the universe is increasing. Gravity should be slowing it down. So there's, there's all these problems with the Big Bang. And there was a, actually a group of scientists that published in a fairly reputable uh, journal called New Scientist, signed by 33 top scientists. Um, and it says the Big Bang theory relies on a growing number of hypothetical entities, things that we've never observed. Inflation, dark matter, and dark energy are the most prominent. Without them, there would be fatal contradictions between the observations made by astronomers and the predictions of the Big Bang Theory. In no other field of physics would this continual resource of new hypothetical objects be accepted as a way of bridging a gap between theory and observation. So you can kind of see that it's, it's more of a myth. And I just encourage you to learn more about uh, creation science and how, it's diff how it differs from secular science. So I remind you again of creation.com, Creation Magazine, Answers Magazine, The Ark Encounter, The Creation Museum. And just so you can always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks. Uh, ask you to give a reason for the hope that you have. But do it with gentleness and respect, of course. Are there any questions out there? I hope there's some good questions. Yes, sir. Part number Newman, uh, asteroid, uh, and there was ejecta. Ejecta formed in the one that you were talking about. That's how they. So I, I didn't hear a good portion of that, I'm sorry. But uh, did you say they, they, they found some glass in the uh, pre-antediluvian? No, no, no. What I'm saying there's two other ones. Mm -hmm. One is that it's all around the world. That proved there was a flood. No question. But there's also a layer under which there, there are no dinosaurs above that. All the dinosaurs there up to that point. And so I was, I was looking at a Nova 
that show that death in the garden is the gas and it produced ejecta and it also produced glass and within the glass famous that's how they Well, they must have made assumptions because they weren't there when the, when the asteroid crashed or, or even when the asteroid was created. So they must have assumed that it started off with all just the parent isotope. They must have used uranium to get ages, ages that old. The uranium lead dating them, if I recall. And so they assumed it was all uranium and no lead. And then they, they started from that assumption and it seemed to me like the, the collision itself would be a process that would mix up some uh, pieces of that asteroid with pieces of the, the earth, the soil, the sand. Um, that glass comes from melted sand, and I think they call it trinonite because they pick it up from nuclear tests uh, at a place called Trinity, uh, as well as asteroid collisions. Um, but they, they just, those assumptions, where did it, what was its composition when it started? Uh, did, did anything change during those billions of years? Um, the Another question. You showed the radioactive the half-life, and you do have copies of that. Right, yeah, that, that's an observation that's made in the here and now, basically. They implied what? I'm they're, they're, trying to, they're trying to use the curve to date objects. Right. So where are we going from? Or where are they going from? Well, to use the curve, you have to, and, and that particular one was carbon-14, so I'll speak to that. Um, <clears throat> you have to assume that they, they measure the ratio of carbon-14 to nitrogen-14. So they assumed like there was, there was basically no nitrogen in there in the sample. It was all carbon. And then so they measured the ratio of carbon to nitrogen and worked their way down that curve and then look at how long it would take just strictly through uh, radiation decay to, to get to that concentration. But if there was some nitrogen to begin with, it'll date much older than, it, than you get with that process. Right, we don't know our starting point. Uh, there's some evidence that shows the rate of decay may change as well. And we, and we weren't there during the thousands or millions or billions of years to see if it was contaminated by something else. So I hope that helps. Also, the uh, layers with the fossils that you mentioned earlier, that are, that are all these different layers of sediment with billions of dead things, that, that's kind of what I would expect after Noah's flood. Just, a whole bunch of sedimentary sediment laid down by water with billions of dead things. Um, so that all fits in with, with uh, the Bible. Uh, any other questions? Awesome. Okay, so the, uh, the first one says, uh, I'm glad you included the illustration of Mount St. Helen. That produced some gems that should be much older according to the carbon-14 dating system. Why do you think the scientists aren't troubled by that it relates to dating other things? Oh. Did, you, did you hear the question, sir? Why no. do you think that scientists aren't troubled by that as it relates to dating other things? I think she's asking about the illustration oh. where the carbon-14 dating doesn't matter. Right. You know, they, they just assume that, that there was an error of some sort, and they, they, it's called outlier rejection. There, there's actually an entire branch of mathematics called outlier rejection. Robust fitting is another word where you try to draw a curve through a bunch of noisy data, and so you're, you're, that's a way of rejecting some of the outlying data. Um, so you just assume there's errors, that there's too many random errors, there might have been human error. 
uh, and they just say, if, if it doesn't fit my belief that it should date this way, then I'm just going to ignore it. There was one more question. Okay. Uh, it was talking about the speed of light. Do you think that light travels at different speeds? I think we had this, this question last week. Um, but in the vacuum of space, uh, it's been measured to be very, very constant over the last couple hundred years that we've been measuring it. Um, now, it could be that during creation, God could have miraculously increased it to a, a very high speed so that all the light from these distant galaxies could, could reach us um, in, in the first few days of creation. So, so God you know, miraculously could have changed it. But science says you know, it's constant uh, going through a vacuum. When it goes through materials, uh, it will change. It will slow down a little bit. Um, I hope that answers the question. Okay. Well, thank you. All right. And again, thank you, Dr. Mike Laudiana, for coming and taking us beyond what the video itself shares and give us some in insight. And, uh, to some of these, I tell you, some of these questions are over my head, but, uh, but they're very fascinating because people understand these things. They may be over mine, too. <laughs> But, uh, you know, it, what fascinates me is that um, in spite of everything, I'm talking about in, everything that there is in terms of science, particularly uh, science that tries to answer things that cannot be observed or looked at or, or basically proven. Uh, you know, the, the Bible has such consistency about it in so many other ways that it's very hard to break apart the consistency. I don't know if that makes sense, but there's just so much about the Bible that fits perfectly, just like uh, Dr. Laudiana said, that, you know, it comes as a whole package, but as a whole package, it fits. I, I learned that even in college when I was being challenged about certain things concerning, say, the date of the Exodus or something of that nature. But when you take the biblical account and then go back to what they were questioning, actually the biblical account accounts for a better answer than, their, than theirs because you take it as a package. And all of a sudden it all comes up and says, oh, it makes sense. So uh, while this may not have anything much to do with this, so, so it's something we, you and I can understand. Here not too long ago, they found on Mount Elba a little piece of writing. A little piece of writing was one of the curses. I don't know if you remember. Oh, yeah. The, uh, in the Promised Land, Mount Elba was the curse mountain, and then Mount uh, Gerritsen, uh, was the uh, the promises and all the all the all the good blessings that would come? This little amulet or whatever you call this little thing had the curses on it on the curse mountain. The dating of that fits with the earliest date of the Exodus. In other words, it it, it proved <laughs> that the twelve hundred and something date of the Exodus cannot possibly take place because this would have been prior to that and it already was. There. So what I'm telling you is you take the Bible as a package, okay? And then when you do that and then you go back and start looking at things, it doesn't matter whether you understand carbon-14 or whether you understand radioisotope dating or any of these other things. What you understand is what can be observed, what can be proven, what can be substantiated, the Bible proves to be right. So that's a good thing. I think if you want to kind of encapsulate everything to kind of a simple understanding. Well, thank you very much, and I know we're past time, so we're going we're gonna to have a closing word of prayer. Uh, please express your appreciation uh, to Dr. Laudiana. The booklets are out there. If you haven't picked one up yet, invite folks to come. This is a great opportunity for you to invite some folks to come and say, hey, we've got a physicist, and you need to hear what's being said. So do that as well. Anything else before dismissed? All right, well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Eddie, would you close this morning? Absolutely. Father, we thank you so much for this day and this opportunity. Lord, we do thank you, uh, Brother Mike, Lord, for bringing uh, this information to us, Lord, from a, a scientific standpoint, uh, standpoint as well as a biblical. Father, we just pray that uh, we would receive this information. You would give us wisdom uh, to be able to call this, uh, uh, present a defense, Lord, if we're called to do so. Lord, we just pray... Uh, opportunities this week to uh, share uh, your good news. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.